you blessed? Are you excited about being in the presence of the Lord? I hope you are. Yes, it sounds like you are. Well, that's awesome. Just want to thank you all for coming. Looks like we got a lot of people on vacation, which is normal on Labor Day, so uh, Labor Day weekend. But I'm glad you all could be here, and I'm excited to bring the message today. Uh, today we begin a new sermon series on entitled Life Changing Prayer. How many believe that prayer, how many have a testimony that prayer changes things, that, that it's life changing? I hope you do because there's power in prayer and I see it at work every day of my life and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to pray. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and we're going to do it through a song. So I, it's not on the board. I want you to close your eyes and uh, just listen to uh, this awesome psalm by David. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it, hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to Him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints. There is no want to those who fear Him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Amen. That's an awesome psalm, man. It, it's not the whole psalm, but that's, that's just the beginning of it. Um, but it, it, it's just an awesome psalm. And um, I've been looking forward to this day for quite a while. I, you know, God gave me this plan, like when I was on vacation back in July, on uh, doing, the, doing this sermon series and Lead, lead Like Jesus. And, um, and today, uh, I'm asking you guys to pray for me as your pastor because I'm starting a 40-day journey. Um, you can call it a Daniel, Daniel plan, toxic fast. I don't know what you want to call it, but um, just trying to uh, do some, some um, fasting and, and just change the way uh, that, basically denying my flesh of food and allowing God, to, with the purpose of, no ice cream, with the purpose of, Drawing near God, and really the higher purpose for me, well that's the highest purpose, but for me personally, I want to be more like Jesus. And I can't do that unless I get closer to Jesus. Because when we get in His presence and we, get, and we, and we, and we, and we see Him, and, and just like we just read that psalm, we, we don't lack anything when we have the Lord, do we? we he, he gives us all that we need. So, um, I just ask you to pray for me. And I just want to tell you, that there's three areas of, in my life that I'm very passionate about that I'm going to be focusing on. And number one is growing in leadership. And, you know, it's one of my passions, one of my biggest passions, is to be a, a leader and to, and to lead like Jesus, you know. And I got a long way to go, you know. And, but, I, but I desire that and I want to do that. And, uh, but I also have a hunger to... Uh, develop leaders and to raise up leaders. I, I want us to be strong. I think, uh, I believe what John Maxwell says, everything rises and falls on leadership. I believe what Greg Cruchel says, that when a leader gets better, everyone gets better. And I believe that leader is influence. And to be an influencer for the lost and for others, we need to lead like Jesus. And we need to look like Jesus. We need to smell like Jesus. We need to be that shining light like Jesus. We need to be the light of the world. That's one thing Jesus, it says in the Bible, that He is the light of the world. Then Jesus gave us the high privilege of also being the light of the world. You are the light of the world. If you have the Holy Spirit within you, you are the light of the world. Amen? And the second area is studying and putting application to God's Word. I, I want to go deeper in His Word. I want to spend more time in His Word because I believe prayer and the Word go together. They, you can't do one without the other. You really need... That's where the power is. That's why I opened, opened today 
I opened um, the prayer with us with the, the Word of God because that is where the power is. When we pray Scripture, we are praying truth, we are praying power, and, and it can change everything. I hope you believe that. Um, and next week, we're going to begin that new study of leading like Jesus. And there's, there's, I have a schedule that Tony was talking about. It's going to be Sunday morning preaching, Sunday evening training, and Wednesday night studying. So we're going to spend three aspects, and we're going to come together, and, and we're going to spend, in the next seven months, we're going to spend 21 sessions to uh, just grow as a, and be a leader. Because everyone who has Jesus is a leader. You're supposed to lead people to Jesus. And if you're not leading people to Jesus, maybe it's because you're not leading like Jesus. Did you ever think of that? I sure have. So we, we need to be focused on leading like Jesus. And the third thing is spending time in prayer. Specifically, um, seeking the face of God, His presence, and to learn. I want to learn how to pray like Jesus. I, I mean, isn't that what the apostles asked? They asked the disciples asking, Lord, teach us how to pray like you. Because they seen... Jesus' prayer life was so powerful, and, and, and he didn't do anything until he heard from the Father, did he? And we need to be the same way. So uh, prayer, and the other thing is, I, as you know, my desire, more than my desire, the, the God's desire is for this church to be a house of prayer. And if the leader, if me, of course God is the head of this church, Jesus is the head, but I am... Uh, the pastor, so I have to set the example for prayer, and I and I just pray that you just uh, just pray for me to to, to lead you guys uh, to be a house of prayer. Wednesday night we had a Bible study. I got to talk about it because I don't know how everybody else felt. I didn't tell everybody what we were what we were doing because I knew I got to move this around a little bit. I'm going to be moving right. Okay, there's a lot of wires up here. I just don't want to trip. But anyway, Wednesday night we, we went to Matthew six, and Matthew six is is so beautiful, and I and I never seen it. I've read Matthew six hundreds of times, but I never seen it like I seen it as I've been studying fasting. I just want to talk about this briefly. Uh, in in Matthew six, Jesus taught us when you give, he told us what to do. Then he said, when you pray. He told us what to do and how to do it. Then he said, when you fast, here's what you do. When I see that, the way he wrote that, that, the way that's written in that sermon, I see fasting is just as important as giving and praying. You might disagree with me. And, I, and we talked about why, don't the, why doesn't the church teach about fasting much? And I think one of the reasons is pastors don't like fasting. So why are we going to teach something that we don't want to do ourselves? I'm just being honest with you, being real with you. We don't want to fast. You don't want to fast. But it, Jesus expects his church to give, doesn't Would you agree with that? He expects our, the church to pray. And he also expects his church to fast. Jesus taught us that as followers, we are to practice giving, practice prayer, and practice fasting. And I believe a lot of it is because we just don't understand. And it took me 33 years as a believer, as, a, as studying the Word of God. To, to I knew fasting was important, but I never seen the magnitude as I do now. How important it is, and it's all part of denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Him. What better way to deny yourself than food? I mean, this king's stomach, man. We we feed this king's stomach, don't we? We we worship this king's stomach. Sometimes this king's stomach is our idol. We do, because you're probably already thinking, you just had that great buffet there. I hated going by there smelling that this morning. But you got that great buffet there, and you're probably already thinking about your next meal. But how about hungering and thirsting for God? Because what do we just read? Taste the Lord and see that He is good. Taste Him. Let, 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 let the Word of God in prayer be your food, spiritual food. And it's going to be much more beneficial for you. I know it's hard, but but... But one thing, I'm going to ask you a question. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. No food. Did he not? Okay. So the question is, if it was important for Jesus before he started his ministry to fast, wouldn't it be something that we should be doing as a church? No response. 
Because we don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. I know you don't. I don't want to do it. But now, but when, when our hunger for God gets stronger than our hunger for King's stomach, then you know that you're going to, God's going to honor, He honors those who honor Him. Does He not? Yes, He does. So, why does the church neglect fasting? I think it's a lot of, the, because of the leadership right here. I think it's a lot that we're ignorant to uh, how, it took me 33 years to see this, church. I am so fascinated by the Word of God because I'm learning so much as I'm in the Word and studying the Word. And, and just stay in that Word. If you're not getting nothing out of it, just stay there because He's going to open your eyes up and let you see stuff. So, while everybody else is focusing on cookouts tomorrow, uh, I'm asking you guys to come here and pray, fast and pray with me. And if I'm the only one here, that's okay because we're, uh, God's going to be here. And, I'm, I'm, and I know it's short notice and I'm not putting any guilt on anybody. If, but, and I know fasting's hard. If you have to give up one meal, breakfast to come here, we're not staying here all day. You know, but I would just ask if you can at 10 o'clock, would love to have you be a part of that. And I, one of the things I talked about on Wednesday night that you've got to pray for me, I've got to get out of the numbers thing. I get so discouraged when only a few people show up. I can't do that because I've got to be obedient to God. God called me to call this fast and prayer for the church. And whether I come or nobody comes, I'm pleasing Him. And that's what I'm here to do. Amen? All right, so today we are going to begin our life-changing prayer. And I couldn't think of a better way to start it than the way we're going to do it. By focusing on the place, the actual place that we go to pray. And where is that? I got it. It's an easy answer. It's kind of right on your face, right in your face. The throne of grace. It's right there. It's probably right there too. Is it? Yeah, you guys got it. The throne of grace. That's where we're going to go today. That's what we're going to talk about today. So let's go to the Word of God in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing that we have a great high priest, and I've never seen the magnitude of this, what, what this means, then, but just meditating on His Word, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly, or the ESV says with confidence, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help to help in time of need. We have a great high priest. And who is that? I, I give you easy questions, Donna. Who is that? Let him hear you say it. He loves to hear his name. I know he does. Do you realize the great significance that Jesus is our great high priest? Do you realize that? If you know the Old Testament, if you don't know the Old Testament, you're probably not going to even understand the significance of it. But the writer of Hebrews, who some claim to be Paul, but really the author is unknown, so we really don't know. The, the writer of Hebrews certainly did, and this is huge. This is really huge. There was a difference between a priest and a high priest. And there's a difference between a priest of today and the high priest that I'm speaking of. But the high priest alone had access to the Holy of Holies. Behind the veil to stand before God. The high priest was the mediator. The go-between a, to a holy God and sinful people. You know, and, and I know even some, I don't know if Catholics still do it. Uh, I think they still go to the priest. I don't know if they do or not. But... Um, we still, ha we, but, 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 let's get back off of that case. But after the, the sacrifice of animals, imagine this. How would you like to go slit the throat of an animal at, for the blood sacrifice? This is what they used to do in the Old Testament for the people. He, he then, the high priest would bring the blood into the Holy of Holies. And, 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 and this was just once a year on the Day of Atonement that he did this. Uh, for the sins that were committed all through the year, because it's only one day of the year that this happened. So I want you to think about that. Think about only the high priest once a year could go into the holy presence of God in the temple. I hope you see the magnitude of this. That that you know, it's not like that today, is it? 
we now have not one day a year only, but we have 24-7 access to the throne of grace. And, and I tell you what, back then, that would have been huge to think that they don't, uh, they don't have to, we, we don't have to sacrifice animals. They're, our sacrifice was done once and for all by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus does, yes, give him a hand. This is a wonderful, sacred throne of grace. It really is. And Jesus doesn't have to return to Calvary every time we sin, praise God. We don't, he doesn't have to go back to Calvary because He did it once and for all. Because all our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when, Jesus Christ, when, when God the Father looks down on you and I, He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see my sin. We are covered by the blood of Jesus. That does not give you a license to sin. Absolutely not. But what it does give you is it sets you free from the bondage. We're no, no longer under the law, but we're under the grace of, of Jesus Christ and what He's done for us. And, and, and that should... Um, let's give Him a shout of praise for that. Let's give Him a shout of praise. Because Jesus is a great high priest. He is, he is the greatest. Of, uh, uh, he is the greatest. There's nobody that compares to Him. Amen? Amen. So let's look at the second... Um, well, the first part we were... I just talked about. Um, seeing that we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, the Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now the second part is, let us hold fast to our confession. Okay? Let, I want to look at Hebrews 10.23. I'm going to be using almost all Hebrews today, except one, because I want Hebrews to Scripture to interpret Scripture. That's what we do. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Who is your hope? Say it louder. I don't... Let him hear you. He's here. He wants you. Without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Our Lord and Savior is faithful. Jesus Christ is our hope. He, he is our only hope, if you really think about it. He is our only hope. If you're putting your hope and trust in anything but the Lord, you're going to get disappointed. You're going to, get, you're going to be discouraged. You're going to be depressed. You're going to fall into uh, you know, whatever. You're going to just fall down. You're not going to make it. You need Jesus Christ. You, we, we all need Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Okay. So, Jesus being our hope. And, 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 I, and I, I know I tell you this verse all the time, but I've got to say it again. Trust in the Lord with what? Trust Him. And what? And what, what do you do all the time like I do? Do you do the same thing I do? Do you lean on your own understanding? Do you try to figure out what's going on? I don't know if you know this or not, but there's spiritual warfare. I'm doing a study on spiritual warfare right now. There's spiritual warfare going on and it, it's, it, it is strong. And I can tell you, I, I, I have never sensed the evil spirits and, this, and the demonic forces that, that, I'm, that I see today that I ever, because I know Satan knows his time is drawing near, and he is coming at us with a fury, because he wants to rob, kill, and destroy us. That's what he wants, ain't it? I've been hearing so many stories lately about things that are happening to people and things that people are doing, and it's just crazy stuff's going on. And, and it's, there, there is demonic forces behind it, believe me. Um, I, want to, I want to look at uh, 15 now, the beginning part of uh, Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. We have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who sympathized with our weaknesses. How many here have weaknesses? If you didn't raise your hand... Wow, come see me after church. I want to talk to you because you got something that, because we need to talk to you about, uh, about lying, really. We got to talk to you about. If you're like me, you got a whole lot of weaknesses. And knowing Jesus is helping us even in our weaknesses is encouraging, isn't it? Knowing that we are weak. You know, we, we do have weaknesses. Jesus is encouraging us. Because Jesus is a compassionate and sympathetic high priest, isn't he? He really cares about you. He wants what's best for you. He didn't say, I came to give life, but more abundantly. But I didn't just come to give life, but more abundantly. He wants us to, to live the abundant life. And the abundant life is found in only one place. If you're looking for any place other than Jesus Christ, you're going to be disappointed. 
It's not going to be in that man or that woman out there. It's not going to be in your children. It's not going to be in your job. It's not going to be in your health because all that can go tomorrow. But, you, but Jesus promised us He would never leave us. He would never forsake us. And we could take that to the bank. He wants us to grow to be more like Him. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing. A, uh, I'm just getting a strong desire to be more like Jesus because I see my weaknesses. I see my sin. I see the ugliness of, of, of me. And, 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 and look at this part in, in the next part. But was in all Jesus, but was in all points tempted as we are. He was in, tempted by in all points as we are. But what, but what was the difference is? Yet without sin. That's a wow because nobody understands our temptations and our weaknesses more than Jesus Christ. He was tempted, as it says here, he in as we are yet in all ways, in all points. Say so he I don't care what your temptation is, what you're going through, Jesus understands and Jesus sympathizes with us because Satan, we know, is the great tempter, isn't he? But Jesus understands the battles. The spiritual warfare we, warfare we go through every day. There's not one day, if you're a child of the King, if you have the Holy Spirit, you are in a, in a, in a spiritual warfare. And remember what the Word says, we are not, we're not, our battle is not against flesh and blood, is it? It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against Satan. He is our enemy, not each other. That's what Satan wants us to do, to be enemies with each other. Because there is not one temptation that you and I are going through that Jesus didn't get tempted and he did it without sin. Now how in the world, and I know what you might be thinking, but Jesus is God, of course he didn't, of course he didn't sin, didn't commit a sin. I'm sorry, but it's true that he is God, but it is also true that he was fully man. And if you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember, Jesus said no. He, didn't, he wanted to take that cup away. He was not willing, his, his man, fully man part, did not want to go through with that so he prayed to God what did he do he prayed to take this cup take this cup of suffering from me because he was tempted to, to, to do that you don't think he was tempted to do that would you be tempted to do that and he sweated great drops of blood yes because that's the that is the battle that was going on with inside of him can you see that can you see the, the the intensity and the passion that was going on right there at that time I mean that is that is awesome that the fact that we can we have someone that went through one of the most difficult temptations. And how did he how did he end this? He said, Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And that is, I'm learning more and more. That's how I end a lot of my prayers. And you know, when you end your prayers like that, it, it takes a lot of pressure off of you. It takes it like puts it on Jesus. Like I don't have to worry about it because not my will, Lord but your will be done. Okay? So, I want us to look at this last verse. This is what I wanted to focus on today, is this, this, this place. Let us therefore, therefore come boldly, or as I said, the ESV says, with confidence to the throne of grace. Okay? This is, this is really powerful. But I wanted you to first see the importance of our great high priest. Do you understand the importance of, a lot of times we don't look at Jesus as our great high priest. We, we look at him as so many other things, our Savior and a lot of other things, but we don't really look at him sometimes as our great high priest. And again, as you study the Old Testament, you'll see how important that is. And Hebrews is loaded with Old Testament teachings. And when I first came to Jesus, when I first read the Bible, the two most difficult books in the Bible in the New Testament was Revelation, of course, and Hebrews. I did not understand Hebrews the first time I read it. Because I, I didn't understand the Old Testament. So it was like, that was like the, the book that was like foreign to me. Now today, 33 years later, I still don't understand it all. But I love Hebrews. I love the book of Hebrews. It's awesome. Um, but I, I am very thankful that I have a great high priest in Jesus Christ. Um, verse 16 speaks of a throne here, doesn't it? It speaks of a throne. And when you, you and I pray... We are coming to a th the throne, to a throne, to a king. Okay, think about that in today. If you were going to a throne, to a king, that, that's what we're doing when we pray. Because a throne is a real place. And it's in heaven, isn't it? And it is forever. 
Look at Hebrews 1.8. Hebrews 1.8 tells us, But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So this is something that is forever. This right here is, we, we see that as an invitation, but it's also a command. It's not just, a, it's, a, it's an invitation, but also a command. Sometimes God's word has invitations, but there's also commands here. And, and that's what, exactly what this is, to come to the throne. Do you know God wants, to, he wants you to come to the throne, how often? Every day, often, we're to pray without ceasing. So we're entering the throne of grace constantly. It should be the place we spend most of our time here on earth. We get to go to heaven. We get access to heaven. Come on. Is that awesome or what? I mean, we get, the, and, we, and we should be praying without ceasing. Therefore, the therefore here, do you see? Let us therefore is here because of what Jesus did as our great high priest, our intercessor. Look at uh, Hebrews 10. I'm going to read 19 through 25. Uh, I, I, I lengthened it out. I was only going to read a few verses, but I think this needs to be lengthened out. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. There you go. That's the only way you can reach this holy of holies by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. Isn't it awesome that we have a high priest over the house of God? So what are we supposed to do? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. I just read this verse, but I'm reading again. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. He who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another. Let us consider one another. Us. He's talking to us to stir up love and good works. We should be stirring each other up to do this. And not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, the coming together. Jesus Christ wants to see his church come together. He wants us to be tight, close, loving one another, encouraging one another, praying for one another. This is what we're supposed to do, not separate it. We're supposed to be together. Not assembling ourselves together as is in a manner of some. some we're doing this, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And that day is a beautiful day, isn't it not? That's powerful scripture. I want to show you one more in Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, 1 and 4. 1 through 4. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. You know, this is after what we talked about. This is in Hebrews 8. We have such a high priest. And you know the beginning of Hebrews talked about how much greater Jesus was than Moses. You know, he was speaking to the Hebrews here. To, than Moses, than the angels. He, he's better than anything great high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. Ain't you glad this is not of man? This is God and it's forever. And it's in heaven. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that this one Who's this one? Jesus also has something to offer. For if we were on earth, for if he were on earth, I'm sorry, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. All right, so I want you to see the fact that we, I want you to look the next last part here. This is what Jesus offers you when you go to the throne of grace. And this is the most beautiful part to me. The whole thing here is beautiful. That we may obtain mercy. I don't know about you, but I need some mercy. You need any, Anybody here need mercy today? We need mercy. I love the scripture where it talks about every morning, every new day, every morning, that his mercies are new every morning. And I like to throw the word tender mercies in there. 
because His tender mercies, every day you wake up, I don't care what happened yesterday, you get tender mercies. You get new mercies every day from Jesus Christ. The first thing we should do when we open our eyes is just praise Jesus. And He should be on our lips when we open our eyes because He's the one that let us open our eyes. He's the one, I like Francis Chan does this. Everybody do this. Has he, let me see if I don't blow this. Uh, Francis Chan says, everybody hold your breath for a second. Now breathe. Now He allowed us to do that. Isn't that awesome that we... He gives us the breath of life. And when we wake up in the morning, we have a new day. And we have His tender mercies. That means that whatever we did yesterday, we just come to the Lord and repent and ask for forgiveness in true repentance. That means we turn. We turn. We don't just say it. We just turn. And we come to Jesus. And we receive His grace. The grace of God. That, that, that's just awesome. Well, mercy. We're talking about mercy first. But God's Word... Uh, also, it goes on and says, and find grace. How many of you need grace? To help in time of need. I guarantee there's not one person in this room that doesn't have a need right now. That is, I have, I have, I've never known it more than I do today. Not one person in this room has it all together. Every one of us have a, has problems. Every single one of us has something going on in our lives. Uh, I, somebody just recently told me about somebody or having problems and I try to tell them the reality is we all have problems you know I could stand up here as your pastor and act like I'm above problems but you know what I'm not you know I just shared with the church this wasn't part of my saying but Friday I got a call at work that my daughter was rushed to the hospital when you get a call like that you don't know what's going to happen and most of you know what my what my daughter you know she's had this uh, drug addiction for 15 years well, she told me last night, she told me that she thought she was going to die. She thought she would, she actually thought she, stuff started happening and uh, she thought she was gone. And, um, but God kept her here again. God saved her again. His grace, even though she took way too many drugs. And I asked her, why did you do it? I don't know. She took way too many drugs. She probably knew that she could die. For, she's pretty smart when it comes to drugs. She knows what she can take. She goes to the brink of death so many times. But God chose for some reason. I believe that she's going to be a powerful witness. But he could have chose to take, take her home. And, and, and that's something that we have to accept uh, what, he, how, what he does. But isn't it comforting to know that in our time of need, God freely gives us His amazing grace. Isn't that, I mean, it's amazing grace. And with God's tender mercies and His amazing grace, isn't that enough to want to go to the throne of grace? What you were, not, even if you don't focus, I mean, we should be focusing on seeking the Lord, but we're actually receiving something every time we go to the throne of grace. His tender mercies, His grace, He's giving it to us, He's pouring it on us. And we need that. Yes, we need that. We need that. I want to, I'm going to finish up with five, I want to make five points here of why we should come to the throne of grace. Number one, we enter His throne in humble reverence. Humble reverence. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Don't you go to the, to the, to the and that boldness, and that, like it says, you might think that boldness and confidence, what it's talking about here, that's talking about just bringing everything to Him. Don't hold nothing back. Let, God already knows everything anyway. Why are we going to think we're going to hide something from God? We're not going to hide nothing from God. You've got to be honest with God. Let Him pour your heart out to Him. If you're mad at God, let Him know you're mad at Him. You know, I'm not saying that's what you should be, but, but he, you, ain't hot. you think you're going to go to Him and think, well, I'm mad at Him, but I'm not going to tell Him. You know, uh, No, He knows, and I've, as a pastor... I have had so many people over the years tell me that they're mad at God. And guess what? That's an emotion. You know, anger's emotion, but in your anger, do not sin. There's going to be times when we are going to be angry at God. But we're just humans. But we've got to go to God and, 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 and have be transparent. But in humble reverence, we are coming in the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? How can you not be humble 
I mean, which, I mean, he is above any any person on this earth who who, who you might think, whoever your favorite person is, whether it be the president, your your favorite football player, baseball player, that you would just be in awe. Oh, when I was growing up, I, I mean, I, I loved sports, and I had I had idols that I, I idolized. I used to cut out their every time I seen their pictures, I used to post them, and you know, we we have idols. We uh, and and if I ever met one of them. When I met Henry Blackaby, when he wrote that book, Experiencing God, when I met him and shook his hand and looked in his eyes, man, that was humbling because I told him, because that book, Experiencing God, is the book that led me to be a pastor. And I told him that. I said, I, I want to thank you for that book you wrote. It changed my life. Because that book, is Experiencing God, is, is finding the will of God for your life. Other people were telling me before that I needed to be a pastor and all this stuff, but I didn't believe it. When I read that book, it opened my eyes and seen that God's call was on my life. If you ever want to read a good book, Experiencing God is an awesome book. And I've got to do that Bible study again. I've done it like four times. I haven't done it for a long, long time. But it, it, it's, it's amazing. But Jesus' power can make or destroy. Can't he? He, so we need to stay humble. And re, just remember this. When you go to the throne of grace, your soul, when you go to the throne of grace... You are entering into a, a God who is a consuming fire. He is a consuming fire. So how can we go any way other than through humble reverence? Number two, we enter His throne with inexpressible joy. We should be joyful coming into the presence of the Lord. Amen? We're coming into His presence of the living God. We are permitted access to this throne that should bring us great joy. And you'd hear me talk about the throne of grace all the time when I pray because I, I, I just can't get over the, the, the awesomeness of the fact that He's allowing us to enter into this throne, enter into heaven, to, to speak to Him and to hear from Him. And it should bring great joy. We should be honored. We should feel honored that our great high priest has given us access to this throne anytime. You can wake up 3 o'clock in the morning and, and, and you can just be hurting and you can be... Uh, no one else to talk to. And I, I remember I did a sermon one time. I said, who is your 2, 2 a.m. friend? Because, you know, you, someone that you could call and they wouldn't get upset if you called them 2 o'clock in the morning. You don't find many friends like that. But th that's the kind of friend, that's the kind of Jesus we have. We're, he's our friend, isn't he? he and, and we can go to him at 2 o'clock in the morning, at 3 o'clock in the morning when the rest of the world is sleeping and we just need, we need a touch from Jesus. If your burdens are heavy, tell them. He told us to cast all our care upon Him, didn't He? He told us to take, that, that, that our burdens are heavy. And, well, what, that, <laughs> I got it mixed up. But His, help me. When you're heavy laden, come to me and find rest for your souls because His burden is light and, and, and He loves us. Confess your sins to, to the Lord. Because he has, he can forgive you, and if that if that don't bring great joy, the forgiveness of sins that that should bring great joy. We should come to pray. With, we should come to the Lord with praise on our lips, just like Jesus taught us how to pray. First thing we do, we acknowledge the fact that He is a holy God, that He's a reverent God, that that we're coming in His presence. You know, prayer is not a little game. You know, do we throw up a little popcorn? I mean, we can throw some popcorn prayers up, but I think it's we're going to the throne of grace. You know, and sometimes we can just cry out to Jesus, yes. But that shouldn't be our standard of prayer that we just throw up popcorn prayers and just go about our way. He doesn't, you know, He wants us to spend time with Him. He wants us to get intimate with Him. He wants us, He wants to see that we're going to sacrifice for Him. He wants to see that we're setting time aside for Him. I love make, making appointments to be with Jesus. We make appointments to be with each other. We make appointments to eat. Why don't we make appointments to be with God? Just meet you and Him. Phones off. Computers off. Just you and me, Lord. Just you and me. So we enter into His throne with humble reverence and inexpressible joy. Number three, we enter His throne in complete submission. Complete submission. We do not pray to instruct God what to do, do we? I hope you don't do that. Again, I'll go back to the fact that we should be finishing our prayers, but Lord, not my will, but your will be done. 
God's told us in His Word that we're to delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Everybody wants the desires of their heart. But are you willing to delight in the Lord? Because when you delight in the Lord, your desires are going to line up with His desires and you're going to get, you're going to get it. Amen? And I already talked about the great distress that Jesus was in when He... When he prayed, not my will, but your will. But I, I just would plead with you, try ending your prayers like that sometimes. Just try, watch the peace that comes over you when you just give it to the Lord. And, that's, and, G, and it worked for Jesus, did it? He went and did the hard thing, didn't he? Sometimes we don't want to do the hard thing. Who in the right mind would go to the throne and dictate to God? I mean, that is, a, that is called coming to the throne in pride, and, I, and that is not good. That is not good. So we enter in the throne with complete submission. Number four, we need to approach the throne with enlarged expectations. Oh, yes. Remember, we're coming to a king. King Jesus. And King Jesus, there's no limit to what King Jesus can do. He can, we've seen in his ministry. What did he do in the ministry? He healed the sick, didn't he? He healed the blind, the paralyzed. He raised people from the dead. And the greatest miracle of all that I consider, we just read a little bit, he lived a sinless life. That is the greatest miracle that, that Jesus Christ did. That he walked this earth with the same temptations as you and I, but he did it without sin. Not one person in this world can ever say that. You can't even say that about one day of your life. I guarantee you that if you, ain't, if you could do everything, you could have a checkbox. I did that right there. But guess what? I bet you committed the sin of omission. I bet there's something you didn't do that you were supposed to do. That person that just walked by you, that looked a lot different than you, and you were a little intimidated by him, and God told you to say a, say a word to him, guess, and you just said, uh-huh, I'm going that way. That's called a sin of omission. You, we, you know, God will do that. I did it. I told you the story about me in the gym, I, and I'm not going to get into it, but... But God told me to go speak to that guy in the gym that's shooting baskets. What did I do? I went right to the bathroom. I'm not, God, I'm not going over there. You're going to think I'm an idiot. So I come out and I'm saying, I'm going home. You know, I was done. I've done my workout. I always go to the bathroom before I leave the gym. I come back out and he's still pressing on me. And, and I started going home and no, oh, he brought me. I, I went there and I told you the story for those of you who weren't there. He was shooting as he shot the ball. I walked in the gym. In the gym, you know, where the basketball goes, and the ball went right in my hands. And I'm like, I got to walk it over to him. He was on the other side of the court. I walked it over to him, and I told him what God told me to come in here, and he wants me to pray for you. And, uh, you know, I've never seen that guy before. I've never seen him again. I wouldn't even remember him if I seen him again. But I just know that God, when he calls you to do something as peculiar as it might seem, when that ball landed in my hands, there was no doubt. That, that's like, I mean, that's like, yeah, God, I got you. So let's go do this. You know, I could have just played around and said, hey, can you mind if I shoot with you? But no, I was there for a purpose. And, and, and sometimes we, we think we're looking like fools. But when God tells us to do something, we can't let what other people think. We can't let what we might not want to do. We just got to do it. Be obedient to him. That's why I'm doing this thing uh, tomorrow. I know that's crazy. It's a holiday. People are going to be with their families and, pe and people are going to be at cookouts and, and, and your pastor's calling you to come to pray. I mean, but that's what God told me to do. So I got to do it. I know it seems crazy and I don't want to guilt anybody again. But there is no limit to the resources of our king. When we pray, we are standing in the palace of the king. The palace of the king. In prayer, prayer we stand where angels bow. You know what? Just read Revelation 4 and 5 and look what's going on in heaven right now. And we get access there. We get to go there. Why would we not want to go there a lot? Talk about escape. We can escape. We can escape. Vacations are escape. Movies are escape. TVs are escape. Well, going to the throne of grace is the greatest escape. We're leaving earth and going to heaven. We're, leave, we're, just, we're just checking out. We're going, we're going. Ask for great things. Because you are before a great high priest on the throne. And I love Ephesians 3.20. 20, I'm going to read 21 too. 
Now to him who is able to, to who's able? I didn't hear you. To him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. What power is working in you? The Holy Spirit. Jesus' Spirit is working in you. You got the same power living in you. I say this all the time. That raised Jesus from the dead. That's the kind of power we possess. To Him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So we come to the throne with enlarged expectations because I know I'm about you guys, but I have prayed a many a prayer and I've come back and said, that's why I say this all the time because I see, wow, you just did exceedingly abundantly more than I could ask, think, imagine. I couldn't have wrote, I couldn't have made a better script. That's, what, that's the kind of Jesus we got. That's the kind of God we got to when we come to pray. Ask. We got to ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. This is the words of Jesus Christ. He wants us to pray. Number five and we're done. Thank you for your patience. We come to the throne with great confidence. Great confidence. I'm just going to say this. I don't. Who shall doubt the king? Why do we doubt the king? I've done it before. I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I go to God in prayer. I've been praying for my daughter to go in this rehab for months and months and months. And I kind of, and I'm like, ah, is she even going to make it? And I keep praying and praying. And she still ain't there. But now there's an opening, so she is going this week, Lord willing. But the point is that God's always right on time. And we don't understand sometimes why he does what he does. I sure don't. But there's times when I doubt. When I go to God and I leave the prayer, I leave the throne, and, and I'm guilty of this. I, I'm guilty of the fact that I doubt the king. Because I haven't seen anything for months, sometimes years. And I doubt the king. Shame on us if we are unbelieving before the throne of the king of heaven and earth. That's Jesus, man. We've got we to get a better understanding of, the, of this power of prayer and how it can change things. And, and, and just, we can't go with doubt. We've got to go with confidence because God is always faithful. Even when you and I are not faithful, He remains faithful. He cannot be anything but faithful. His promises are truth. So we stand with confidence in the promises of God. I love the promises of God. I lean on the promises of God. The promises of God have saved me from, the, from so many things over the years. I used to use the index cards. Uh, everywhere I went, I had index cards written down with Scripture to help me because I was struggling and, and, and now, a lot of that scripture is, this is when I first came to Jesus, now it's, it's in my heart. Not that I, I shouldn't need it on an index card, but it's, it's hidden in my heart. And when things come up, I remember God. Uh, when I was wondering Friday uh, about my daughter, I had a peace. I had a peace because I believed that whatever happened, it, it was going to be the will of God. I believed that. I believe that because I believe in the promises of God. And I hope you do too. We should have the deepest sincerity when we approach the throne of King Jesus. Just the deepest sincerity. Isn't it a privilege to, to know that you can come to the throne of grace with great confidence into the presence of King Jesus at His throne? I want everybody to close their eyes. We're going to close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to Your throne with humble reverence, with inexpressible joy, in complete submission, with enlarged expectations, and with great confidence. We're still praying. I'm just going to read a prayer before we get into the Lord's Supper. This is our time for examination. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, 
according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and my sin and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, your desired truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lord, as we get ready to come to your table, we examine our hearts now. And Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the opportunity to come to your table. Oh God, you're just, this is just so awesome, Lord. We got to come to your throne. Now we get to come to your table. Lord, we just pray that as we close today in communion, Lord, that you just uh, help us to examine our hearts and to look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy that we can find when we come to your throne. We've already received it today. And Lord, we ask you, Lord, as we come to your table, that you uh, pour out your blessings to us, Lord. And we come here in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.